Uh, what we're going to do in this talk is uh, first uh, start with uh, uh, what Joe uh, Salerno was just uh, speaking about. This is the uh, demonstration of how it is that the human mind organizes the external world in such a way that uh, production uh, of uh, goods uh, satisfies this person's uh, preferences or, or wants. And we'll do this, uh, we'll, we'll uh, provide a more detailed description of this uh, process um, uh, than uh, Dr. Salerno did, just so we can see the exact uh, extent to which the human mind uh, controls and organizes all of the different aspects of action. This is the crucial point. <clears throat> and then uh, in the second half of the talk, we'll discuss how uh, this, is, uh, this process of economizing is replicated for society uh, in general uh, through uh, the market pricing system. So uh, this was, uh, as Tom Woods uh, pointed out uh, last night, this was one of the, uh, the awe-inspiring <laughs> insights uh, that economics uh, provides us. Uh, when, when we uh, grasp this uh, feature of the market economy, that the market economy uh, permits us in, in the social uh, arena <clears throat> to use resources in, in uh, producing in such a way that we economize, that is, we get the greatest value of the things produced and we produce each thing in the least cost way uh, for society as a whole. And then we want to point out that the bridge, as Mark just pointed out, Mark Thornton pointed out, the bridge between these two realms of uh, action, the action of Robinson Crusoe isolated uh, on his desert island and the uh, interaction of all of us in society, the bridge between these two uh, is exchange in the market. And so we want to show the interface um, uh, be between the two uh, realms. Okay, as, as you'll uh, learn in the, in the uh, lecture after this one, um, economic uh, theory begins by reflecting on what it means to engage in human action. So as Mises pointed out, we can understand human action because we are human beings. We engage in human action, so we know what it means to formulate an end, to design uh, action, to identify things in the world that are useful as means, to apply the means to the attainment of our ends, to succeed or fail, and so on and so forth. So all uh, economic theorizing begins with this uh, basic unfolding um, that we can uh, uh, garner by uh, reflection or introspection about the basic features or concepts of action. So we start with a definition of human action. Human action is purposeful behavior. This means that we uh, aim our action uh, to attain an end, or we say the desire to attain the end is our motive for action. <clears throat> and we recognize right away, because we are human beings, that uh, when we engage in human action, we have an end in mind that we're striving to attain. We also immediately uh, understand that having an end does not constitute action. That formulating an end in our mind is not synchronous with the realization of the end. This is because we're finite beings. Uh, you know, infinite beings could, would make no distinction between ends and means. They would just will something to be and it would be. But uh, we are finite and therefore we make a distinction between ends and means. And we recognize right away that our means are uh, inadequate to attain our ends. That is, our ends are not fully and continuously satisfied. Uh, we have uh, desires, uh, wants, and preferences uh, that uh, we wish to attain, but we, up to this point, lack the means to uh, do so. Or we say uh, in economics that our means are scarce. Now, if our means are scarce, we have to choose when we act between competing ends that we could attain with our scarce means. And then for each end that we select, we would have to choose between different competing sets of means that could uh, aid us in accomplishing the end. So we have two uh, margins for choice. And as uh, Professor Salerno already pointed out, um, 
human action, if we want to uh, state the mode of human action in one word, it's economizing. So cats uh, act on the instinct to catch mice. Sort of. Human beings act in an economizing way. Uh, that is to say, given the choice between competing ends we, with a given means, we choose the more valuable end, whatever we anticipate being more valuable to us, and we set aside the less valuable end. All of our choices and thus all of our actions then are based upon a difference in value that we perceive between competing ends on the one side and then competing sets of factors of production on the other. So we economize across these two margins of choice. Uh, we choose the more valuable end, we set aside the less valuable with given means that we are using. For a given end that we choose, we select the least costs set of means, and we uh, allocate the uh, more valuable means to other ends that, uh, that would have the greater value that's being imputed to those means. <clears throat> Now, we call this uh, principle of uh, valuing options a preference. So this is the word we uh, use to refer to the fact that we uh, rank order the uh, most valuable and the next most valuable alternative in action, uh, preferring one alternative to the other. <clears throat> uh, just a, uh, another word about uh, preference with respect to distinguishing the Austrian view from competing uh, like mainstream view and other uh, positions on this whole process of understanding human action. When we use the term preference, we're referring to the valuation that a person makes between competing ends or again competing sets of means that impels them to choose. That is, it's bound up in their choice. So preference isn't our uh, musings or deliberations upon action. Preference is the state of mind in, in which we choose and we say, okay, I'm going to the Mises University this week and I'm foregoing other alternatives. <clears throat> now, on the subjectivity of value, uh, because that's in the title, I, I want to mention the way in which we use this uh, term subjective. Um, we, we might alternatively just say that value is personal. Value is of the human subject. That's what we mean by subjective. It's in our minds, in other words. Value is, just exists as a state of mind. And so it's uh, locked up in our minds. It has no uh, extensive property, value. And therefore, because it has no extensive property, it cannot be measured. We cannot define a unit of it. As Professor Salerno uh, pointed out, uh, the, the, the idea that we could uh, formulate utils of utility is just uh, nonsense. <clears throat> All we have is a state of mind uh, that resides only in the mind of the individual person. Uh, so this is what we mean by subjective. Now it should also be pointed out that there's another feature of value that is important in um, analyzing action. And this again is something we realize upon reflection. When we think about our action, we realize right away that our valuations with respect to the external world and the attainment of our ends are not constant. We don't, we don't formulate a value and then we say, oh, forevermore, I value water in a particular way or I value a grape juice in a particular way or I value uh, studying physics in a particular way. That instead, uh, our valuations tend to change. Now that, that is neither here nor there with respect to subjectivity. We could imagine a, a person who had relatively stable values with respect to the external world and people who were wild and crazy and always did things differently and were very difficult for other people to anticipate. Um, subjectivity refers only to the fact that value is a state of mind. Uh, because value though is not constant <clears throat> with respect to external conditions and the, and the effect on our action, we can't uh, theorize about uh, utility or value by using mathematical functions. Because in order to have functional analysis, we have to have constants and variables. And we have no quantitative constants uh, that we can apply to the relationship between features of the external world and our, the judgments of our minds by which we act and then we produce 
effects. So there are no uh, constants between the external uh, inputs into our action and the external effects of our action. <clears throat> now it follows from our uh, discussion that uh, since we're preferring one thing to another in action, that not only is the value of our uh, selected alternative subjective, but the value of the foregone alternative is subjective. That is, the cost of our action is also fundamentally subjective. So you come to the Mises University, you choose this very wisely as the most valuable alternative, and you gave up something less valuable. You know, a week on the beach in Florida, or uh, you know, hiking in the mountains, or uh, you know, working and earning some income on a part-time job, or whatever it was. But, but the value of that, too, in your choice is subjective. That is to say, you, you just value it in your mind, and you uh, rank order that value against the value of your alternative. It's also true, then, that profit, that is the net benefit from action, the difference between the value of what you choose and the value of what you forego, uh, which we could call profit, Rothbard calls this psychic profit, or we could call it subjective profit, that, too, is a fundamental feature of human action. Profit is not a wicked uh, capitalist device for exploiting the working class or something. It, it, it's fundamental to all action, because all action is based upon identifying a difference in value between alternatives and choosing the more valuable alternative and foregoing the less valuable. <clears throat> okay, so now we want to uh, get to... Uh, my depiction of value imputation, Professor Salerno has given you a more uh, robust uh, diagram, but this one I want to use just to make comparisons and so we can simplify it. The, the top line is the uh, Austrian view of uh, the relationship between value uh, that exists in our minds, the value of consumer goods, and then the value of producer goods that uh, are causally related to the production of the consumer good. So I'm hungry at lunchtime, uh, I want a consumer good like a ham sandwich. And because I value the ham sandwich, I value the ham and the bread and the mayo and so on and so forth. Right? That's the way value is uh, uh, judged and, and uh, assigned uh, by, the, by us as human beings. Notice that it has to be this way because as we already uh, pointed out, uh, the whole point of engaging in action is to satisfy an end. And, and the formulation of the end is in our minds. So if the consumer good doesn't satisfy her end, we don't place value on it. It can't have value independent from the value we place on the satisfaction of our end to which we're putting this consumer good. And the same would be true of producer goods. Now, one, one uh, uh, difficulty arises here when we, when we put the arrows in this, in this direction and, and we uh, think about this uh, problem. And again, Professor Salerno pointed this out on his diagram, the vertical diagram with the bread and the and stages of production for bread, where he pointed out that production moves from the top of the diagram down, but value from the bottom of the diagram up. Value moves from the mind to the consumer good to the producer good, but right now all I have is the producer goods. I, I have all the ingredients to make the ham sandwich, and I choose to make the ham sandwich then I'll have the consumer good, then I'll realize the value of my end. So you see these two things seem to be uh, non-synchronous in time. Now what reconciles this, of course, is uh, entrepreneurial anticipation. What reconciles this is, I think at lunchtime, here I am in my kitchen at lunchtime over at the game day, and I get out the, uh, uh, you know, I say, well, I think I'd like a ham sandwich. I think the realization of you know, the end that I wish to attain is the eating of the ham sandwich. And I have the producer goods available to me, so I begin to assemble the ham sandwich. I devote the producer goods to the production of the consumer good, and then I take the consumer good and I realize my end. And so it's only, as I act, it's only in anticipation of the realization of my end that I'm able to choose with respect to the producer goods, how should I use them now, and then the consumer good that I'll produce, and then the use of the consumer good to satisfy my end. And, and, that, and, and this is not uh, you know, indicative in the arrows right, that, that I've uh, used. So I, I simply want to point this out. Now the, the uh, middle uh, uh, row shows us the uh, cost of production theory. 
So this would be the view that we reject, uh, uh, that Professor Salerno again talked about a little bit in the uh, British classical economics, that producer goods have value intrinsically, and then through production, that, that value is transferred to the consumer good, and then once the consumer good has this value, our minds assent to it, the final arrow of the, uh, on the diagram. Now, uh, all sorts of uh, analysis could be done of uh, theories of this sort, but you can see the basic uh, uh, mistake that's made by this theory right away. The basic mistake is it ignores this ends means structure of action. Right? We, we, we already know just by being human beings and engaging in action that all of our action is designed to attain our ends. And therefore, all the value that flows from action must come from the value of the end that we satisfy. It could not possibly be the case then that producer goods have a value independent of our ends in human action. This is just a wrong-headed thinking from the very start. <clears throat> now the last row is the neoclassical view of uh, uh, th this relationship between the value of things that says that the uh, value of a consumer good is jointly determined by the val our subjective preferences, the value of the mind on the left-hand side, and the independent value of producer goods on the right-hand side. Now again, a lot could be said about this, and we won't take the time to go into it. It's not our purpose in this lecture. I, I do this to kind of whet your appetite just to see you know, how to categorize these things and so on. But again, uh, you can see right away the basic problem with this is producer goods cannot have independent value. They simply cannot, if, unless you're willing to deny this ends mean structure of action, this, this basic fundamental uh, conceptual uh, understanding that we have of action. As long as that is true, then, then that sort of reasoning process cannot be the case. Producer goods uh, could not have value independent of the mind itself. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, as I said, the, what we want to turn to is an uh, elaboration on what uh, Professor Salerno was talking about and we'll use Caruso again to uh, illustrate this, to bring out some additional points and to see the, in, in more uh, full view the way in which the human mind organizes all the external features of the world in such an, in an economizing way to satisfy ends. <clears throat> so let's suppose uh, that uh, we start uh, this way. Let's suppose we have Caruso, he's on his island, and he has two consumer goods available to him. He has coconuts, and he has berries. And he has producer goods, he has his labor, and then he has uh, coconut uh, groves, there are coconut trees and various configurations around the island, that he can uh, combine his labor with the coconut trees and produce coconuts. And then he, they're berry bushes. And again, these are configured in a particular way. He, he would find this out by investigating um, the nature of the island. So he'd walk around and just see the clumps of berry bushes over here and over there, and, uh, and so on. And let's suppose then that, um, that he, he, uh, he values the, these, uh, these uh, two goods in the following way. Now here we're not doing anything different than Professor Salerno did. We're just, you know, we just changed the goods a little bit. So these are the, his uh, preferences that uh, Caruso has for the consumer goods or his marginal utility, as Professor Salerno was calling it. And we want to stress one point here that... Um, uh, uh, one important point that wasn't stressed in the earlier lecture, and this is, if we look at the top-ranked item here, and I'm just, uh, you know, as, as, as we do uh, these imaginary constructs, as we call them, we can, we can uh, configure them however we wish, right? If we were doing a real example, we'd just find Caruso and see what he did. So, so I'm just uh, suggesting that uh, Caruso does the following. He has the first two coconuts that he gathers up. He's going to use for drinking the milk. He's going to split them apart and then drink the coconut milk. Now, he, the point is this that we don't want to miss. The, the, uh, in every action, in this one in particular, Caruso is choosing the amount of the consumer good that he deems suitable for the attainment of his end. He chooses to drink to the milk of two coconuts. He could choose one coconut, he could choose three, he could choose half a coconut. That, that's a choice variable for him. What the, what the appropriate unit or amount of the good is. 
is also a choice variable. So let's say, I'm just making this up, let's say he chooses two coconuts, and then he drinks and satisfies the most valued end that he can formulate in his mind for a unit of coconut, a, a, a unit of this good that's two coconuts. Now, once we've done that, we can compare uh, that value with the value that uh, Caruso would get from another action that he would take, also using two coconuts. You see that as the lowest rank. The second two coconuts, he would break apart and he would mash up and he would eat the meat of the coconut. And he also wants two coconuts to do that. He doesn't want three or four or ten. He could, but I'm just saying uh, to... Uh, for our analysis, we uh, keep the unit of the good the same. In fact, not only the same, but we make the uh, assumption, if you will, of equally serviceable units. The two coconuts that he uses to uh, drink would be the same as the two coconuts he uses to eat. As Professor Salerno, uh, in his example, was uh, uh, pointing out, uh, the sacks of grain are the same, right? The person is not discriminating or valuing the sacks of grain, or in my case, the coconuts, because they are more suited to one use and less suited to another. They're, they're interchangeably useful. <clears throat> okay, and then we have the principle of diminishing marginal utility, right? The first law of utility. We see that the second two coconuts would be worth less to Caruso than the first two coconuts. And we also have on this uh, value scale, or preference ranking, uh, the berries. And the unit for berries that Caruso selects is two quarts. So that's how much he wants to eat. He wants to eat a two quart unit during the day. And then once he does that, he's done with eating, and for a, the second two quart unit of berries, he would do something else. He would mash them up and drink the, uh, uh, the berry juice. And then for the third quart, he would make bait. And then he would uh, you know, try to bait traps and catch small game, or whatever else he, he might be doing. <clears throat> OK, so we see uh, from this example the first law of utility, diminishing marginal utility, right, would apply both to the berries and to uh, coconuts and to any other good that we could conceive of that, uh, uh, that a person is using. And the second law of utility we might also mention the second law of utility is that more of a good is preferred to less. As long as something is a good, it is not super abundant, and it's a valuable means to an end. Having more of it, a person would prefer to having less of it, because more ends can be satisfied, of course, if you have more units of a means. Now, the thing that uh, Professor Salerno did not point out about this, this configuration is that we can see exactly now how Caruso would allocate all of the consumer goods available to him um, on the island, not just one thing or another thing. <clears throat> we can see that what uh, Caruso would do, again, if he has this particular value scale, is that he would, uh, he would uh, take the first two coconuts and he would uh, uh, drink the coconut milk, and then the value of doing more things with coconut falls fairly dramatically, and so he, he would go to the next highest valued alternative, and he would take two quarts of berries and eat them. But now he satisfied that end, and he would move on to a less valued thing, right? And so on and so forth. So you can see that if the marginal utility of, of one uh, action or uh, one good is up here, and the marginal utility of another is down here, a person allocates toward the higher valued alternative. But as they do, diminishing marginal utility lowers further use uh, that they would get out of that thing until the marginal utility of something else is now above the marginal utility of the first thing. So you can see that the maximizing of utility would come about. The greatest economizing uh, that Caruso can do to get the greatest value out of his consumer goods, he will allocate them to different activities so that the marginal utility is roughly the same. Now, you'll see right away that the same thing, exactly the same thing happens in the market. The only difference is, in the market, we have monetary values. So if rates of return on uh, tablet computers is way up here, like it was a few years ago, and rates of return on producing steel is down here, then resources will move uh, away from lower value toward higher value. But as you produce more and more of the good where the 
uh, rates of return are high, those rates of return will be pushed down. How far do things get allocated toward those things? Well, until the rates of return come into conformity, until the marginal utility of things is roughly the same. So this principle, too, is not just uh, something that happens in the capitalist system. Uh, it happens in all of our lives. We're doing this uh, all of the time. <clears throat> uh, now let's take the uh, case of production. Let's uh, uh, put in production explicitly and see some of the principles here, the basic principles, the law of returns. Now, the law of returns comes from the finitude of the productive capacity, the complementary factors of production. So every production process, Caruso on his island, uh, 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 that we're using to illustrate would have complementary factors of production, pr uh, factors of production used together. <clears throat> and so Caruso is producing coconuts. He's, uh, he's got the coconut trees, he, and he has his labor. But the coconut trees have finite capacity to produce in combination with labor. And more than likely, the coconut trees are configured in a particular way that would cause something like this uh, schedule of marginal MPP as marginal physical product of labor. So if Caruso applies one unit of labor, let's say it's a half hour of uh, coconut gathering, if he wants to economize, if the point is to get the most coconuts he can, he'll gather the coconuts from the shortest, most robust coconut trees closest to him. But once he exhausts all of those, then he has to go either to taller trees, more difficult to climb, with less, uh, less robust, uh, fewer coconuts on them, and his uh, output will decline. And then he goes to even taller trees, or more difficult ones to get, or he goes to trees farther away, and he has transportation costs, he has walking time, that lowers the number of coconuts he can pick in a half hour. That's the law of returns. In fact, this is what we would call diminishing returns. Every production process, is, it process reaches a point of diminishing returns because there's a finite productive capacity of the complementary factors of production that you're using in combination with the variable factor, adding more and more labor to the fixed set of complementary factors. <clears throat> uh, you can see why this would be important, right? Because as Caruso produces more coconuts, his marginal physical product goes down, then eventually he's going to allocate his labor towards something else because the marginal physical product and the marginal utility of coconuts goes down as he allocates more labor to producing coconuts. Eventually then the marginal physical product of berries or the, we would say the marginal value product of berries would, would be higher ranked than the marginal value uh, product of coconut production. So the same thing happens in berry production he applies the first uh, half hour of labor to the most robust berry bushes closest to him. He gets two quarts of berries, but now when he goes back to pick some more, he has to go to berry bushes that are less robust or further away, and his production, his marginal uh, productivity falls. <clears throat> okay, so this is the law of returns. And again, what this means is that when he uh, establishes his preferences for the use of his labor, when he's allocating his labor now, so now we're, we're moving for Caruso allocating his consumer goods to his producer goods, showing again how Caruso's mind organizes all of this. So he's allocating his labor. How does he do this? He allocates it to the highest marginal value product activity. So this is six coconuts he can get with a half hour of labor he, because he values the coconuts highly and he can get a lot of coconuts with his first unit of labor. So that's where his first unit of labor goes. But once he does that, then, then doing more coconut gathering gives him much less marginal value product. He can get, he can get uh, as we said before, five more coconuts with his second unit of labor, but he doesn't value these very highly because six coconuts, he can attain quite a few of his ends. And so that makes room for berry production. Now the next unit of labor would be applied to berry production. It would have the marginal value product, the, the marginal utility of the two quarts of berries. And then the third unit of labor, he also goes for berries, and this marginal value product is diminishing. And then once he gets done with uh, four units of labor in these two activities, he allocates to other 
activities that I, I'm not putting on the, on the preference scale. So this is how he organizes the allocation of his labor. Right? According to value differences, most valuable thing first, then moving down the scale, other marginal value product, uh, high marginal value product activities then come in, and so on and so forth. So he allocates so that the marginal value product is roughly the same. All across all the different uses of this, of this item. Again, you see, the, you see the very same thing happen in the market. The price of a given input is the same in all the uses across the market. So, you know, a basic manual labor, it's the same in uh, you know, all the different uses to which it's put on all the different assembly lines and all the different construction tasks and so on. <clears throat> because if, if there were differences in value, if you could employ a worker and pay the market wage, which is the same everywhere, and get a value up here above it, then as an entrepreneur you would do that. The entrepreneurs would rush in to buy that labor and they would push the price up. They would bid uh, the price up and bring it, and then these, these two would come into conformity. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is the uh, uh, way in which the uh, Caruso uh, then comes to value the uh, producer goods. Now let me say one last thing about this. We'll talk about uh, this in more detail this, uh, this afternoon in the lecture on the, the division of labor. But Caruso, you know, this is a fairly simple <laughs> explanation. You know, uh, we don't have the time to go into all the nuances of all this, but, <clears throat> but it's uh, not difficult to see that Caruso can engage in more complex production processes all organized by his mind. So he can engage in, these are uh, what we call direct production processes, right? He's just one step of production, he gets the coconuts. One step of production, he gets the, he gets the berries. But he can engage in multiple uh, steps of production. So this afternoon, we'll talk about how he builds a net through saving and investing. And each of the steps of that production is also organized by judgments of his mind by his intellect perceiving what the cause and effect connections are among the objects in the world, and then his valuing of those things. And this, this uh, activity, this organizing of production, it can extend you know, to, to uh, certain limits. And again, we'll talk about those limits uh, this afternoon. <clears throat> now, the next thing we want to uh, discuss is why it isn't possible for this process that Caruso uses of valuation to organize in an economizing way a production in society. Uh, just to state the, uh, the principle here, <clears throat> so we, we see that Caruso, uh, by this process of valuing things, organizes all of the, the production activity that he engages in. And again, we just call this valuation. This is the process of valuation. <clears throat> in society, we have a process that's a called appraisement. And appraisement is using uh, monetary entries to make production decisions. Instead of just the valuations in our minds, the entrepreneurs in the market use uh, calculations of uh, net income and net worth. So they're using monetary entries and again, the use of these monetary entries is called appraisement. <clears throat> okay, so why do we need appraisement? Why is valuation not uh, sufficient? <clears throat> well, the answer is that value, as we uh, spoke about before, that values are subjective. And so they're uh, not comparable between individuals because the value in my mind is uh, a product only of my mind. It has no extensive property. The value in your mind, a product of your mind, again, with no extensive property, no shared property, by which we could define a common unit of value. So if I say I get 10 units of value from eating a chocolate ice cream cone, and you say, well, I get 12 units of value from eating a vanilla ice cream cone, we haven't objectively compared our utilities because we don't know that we're sharing the same sized unit of value. So because of this, when we have social uh, pr production in society, if we're using resources to satisfy the consumptive ends of one group of people, and therefore we can't use those resources to satisfy the consumptive ends of another group of people, we can't, by valuation, decide which 
uh, set of consumptive values is greater than the other because we simply can't make this comparison. It's uh, scientifically impossible or objectively impossible. So valuation wouldn't, uh, would, would not uh, be efficacious in this respect. Neither could we judge the uh, opportunity cost this way because it too is just a product of uh, each individual's subjective assessment in his or her own mind, and we can't interpersonally compare these. So if we want to have a coal miner in society and uh, they're going to select between you and, and me, I would insist that my opportunity cost is very high. And so would you, presumably, unless you just get a thrill out of being in the dark, uh, dungy uh, coal mine. Uh, you would do the same. And, and no, no third party could ever objectively decide between us, oh, yes, I see that your, your subjective value is uh, greater than, than uh, the other person's subjective value. This is, this is a non-starter, right? This cannot work. <clears throat> so instead, what, uh, what, we, what can be done in society is to have all of our preferences expressed in a common unit. So if, if, we, if we buy all things and express our preferences for and against money, then it does become possible to say that I value chocolate, a chocolate ice cream cone relative to money more than you value a chocolate ice cream cone. If I'm the one who buys the chocolate ice cream cone at a price of $5, and you at the same time uh, refuse to buy it, then we know objectively who values this good more highly. And we can use the, uh, the, these monetary uh, results, money prices, in this process of economic calculation and then entrepreneurial appraisement. Now, uh, let me just make this other point that we made about valuation. Remember we said for Caruso, when he's imputing value, uh, he, he starts with producer goods, and then he's going to allocate them right now. He's going to say, I'm going to use my uh, labor to uh, pick these uh, or, uh, berries, and then I'm going to realize the value of the consumption in the future. But right now, I can only anticipate what it will be. We, the same in society, right? We have these resources, we have labor and land and all these uh, capital goods, and entrepreneurs are making production decisions now in anticipation of what consumer value they will have in the future once the goods are produced. <clears throat> um, but, this va the, but the point here is simply that this valuation has to be uh, monetary. Okay, this is the schematic that shows us uh, how, how all this is organized. And uh, this too is scaled down from what we could make it. So I, I, just, I just want us to see the basic uh, construct here. So we have preferences at the top. Everything emanates from preferences. As Professor Salerno said, all, all, all the economy comes from human beings. It comes just from us. We, we uh, through the process of acting, we organize all the, all the processes of production. We value all the different elements of production and so on. So we just start with preferences. And then these preferences will lead to our buying and selling of consumer goods. And then the prices of consumer goods will emerge. And we're, gon we're going to talk about that that trilogy. We want to go through the logistics of the theory of how our preferences through demand and supply uh, determine prices. Now, once we have prices of consumer goods, these will uh, uh, infer costs for us as consumers and revenue for the entrepreneurs who sell the consumer goods. With the revenue that the entrepreneurs have, they can demand the factors of production or the producer goods. So our preferences then constrain the entrepreneurs through the revenue that we provide by buying the goods that they produce to demanding the producer goods. If we like these goods uh, more, we, we like the new uh, uh, iPad mini, and so we, uh, we pay the three twenty nine. dollars a lot of us. Uh, what did they sell, 50 million units or something they anticipate selling this year? <clears throat> then we'll generate uh, revenue. Uh, for Apple, and they, they can use this revenue to, uh, to then uh, uh, buy producer goods to produce what they anticipate in the future will be valuable to us. And so this will, uh, creates demand for the producer goods, and then our preferences determine supply of the producer goods. So we have preferences for supplying our labor, or if we own land, we have preferences for supplying land and so on. So once again, our preferences come through to demand for producer goods through entrepreneurial agents. 
And then our preferences also determine the supply of the producer goods. And so preferences determine the prices of producer goods through demand and supply. And then the prices of producer goods determine income for the producers, determine the wages and the, the rent for land and so on. And then the costs for the entrepreneurs, or what they have to pay to buy their inputs. And economic calculation then, the entrepreneur compares these revenues for uh, you know, the value of the producer goods uh, that he can make with the costs of the inputs. And if he thinks, well, I can bear these costs and, and uh, produce this uh, good and sell it at this price uh, in the future, then this justifies the production. And the production would be undertaken precisely because uh, through this pricing structure, we have the indication of what is and is not economizing. What, what is generating greater value, monetarily speaking, that we're determining through our preferences uh, for uh, goods, uh, consumer goods produced in one line of production relative to another. <clears throat> okay, now again, we don't, we don't have the time in this, uh, uh, in this hour to go through uh, you know, all of this. As I suggested, we, we just wanna go through the first uh, three steps, just to show from preferences, how we get supply and demand, then to uh, the prices of consumer goods, and we've suggestively uh, entertained uh, how the rest of this would be put together and uh, during the week uh, some, some of this additional work will be done. Okay, so let's uh, move to this example. A couple of weeks ago I looked up on uh, eBay uh, what the price for uh, used uh, iPad 2s happened to be. And so there, there's a reigning price on eBay. Well, when I looked it up, it was uh, $300. And so I've configured my example to conform to that price. In other words, that's, how, that's what we're really doing when we do economic analysis. We're saying, there, here's a price in the market for something. How, how do we explain this? Why isn't the price for, the, for a used iPad 2, why isn't it $500? Why isn't it $100? Why is it $300? And our answer will be, uh, most of you know this, right? Uh, already you studied a little bit of economics. Our answer is that, well, that happens to be the price that clears the market. And so we want to explain how, how that process comes about. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we have a, you know, just a person with preferences for the used iPad 2. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm using a used good here just so we uh, set aside for the moment the uh, pr uh, problem of what's the relationship of cost of production to these prices. We'll get to that, that at the end, but here, here there's no question the cost of production could enter into this, right? The sellers of the used iPad 2 are just consumers. It's just a consumer who bought it uh, you know, two year, or a year ago or two years ago. Okay, so let's say we have this person and has preferences for the used iPad, and these preferences are such that uh, we see that this person would, uh, would buy the iPad, what we call the first iPad 2, the most valuable one, if the price were $400 or less. But if the price were 500, this person would not buy. And if the price fell enough, then uh, this person, if the price fell all the way to uh, $100, if that happened to be the price instead of, let's say, it being 400 or 300, this person would buy two. And he'd be, you know, use one and give one to, uh, as Professor Salerno said, to a Junior, and let Junior use it. <clears throat> uh, this, of course, then uh, gives us the law of demand. So we see that the law of demand is a direct result of the first law of utility. Uh, only at lower prices will people buy more of a good, as we say, uh, satyrs paribus, or if we wish to state the law in a slightly different way. Uh, for any given purchase a person makes, uh, if the price would have been lower, then the quantity purchased would have been larger or the same. This is the law of demand. <clears throat> Uh, and then we can use the same preference rank, of course, since we're using a used good here, to illustrate the law of supply. Let's suppose we had somebody uh, who already owned uh, both uh, the first iPad and the second. And he goes on eBay to sell. Well, we see that he, he would sell the second iPad at a price $200 or above, but not if the price were 100 If the price were just 100 he'd keep them both because he has a use value for them. But he'd be willing to give up that use value for the, he'd be willing to take Junior's iPad and sell it, right? Uh, if the price were 200 or above. 
So we get a quantity supplied of one at 200, at one at 400, if the price were you know, anywhere uh, between those levels. Uh, but if the price were 500, he'd sell two. He'd sell them both. And then because he values the money more highly than, uh, than the marginal utility of, of uh, each of those uh, high paths. So we see the law of supply, right? Only at higher prices will the quantity supplied be larger. Uh, Sater's paribus. And you can see right away that the law of supply and the law of demand would be consistent with one another only at a single price or at a small range of prices. If at higher prices, the buyers want to buy more and the sellers want to sell less, and if at lower prices, the buyers want to buy more and the sellers want to sell less, then we would find consistency between uh, the buying and the selling only at, certain, at a certain range, maybe even small range of prices. That range of prices we call market clearing. <clears throat> so let's go on to, uh, to uh, see this. Uh, to see this, we need uh, multiple buyers and sellers. So we'll just introduce a couple more uh, buyers. So we have buyer A. This is, uh, uh, this is the person we, we showed on the last uh, uh, slide who's, who's uh, willing to pay 400 but not 500 to buy the first iPad. And we have buyer B who's a little less eager to buy the iPad. He'd, he'd pay 300 but not 400 So buyer A could outbid him if it came to that. And buyer C is the least eager of our three buyers. He's willing to pay 200 but not 300 So both B and A could outbid him. Uh, here we're just uh, relying upon the auxiliary uh, premise that, uh, about the real world that uh, different people have different preferences for things. So there's some buyers in markets who are more eager, some buyers who are less eager. And, and we're just building our example around that. So we see down here that at different hypothetical prices, we get different quantity demands in the market. Right? Uh, buyer one, or excuse me, buyer A uh, at the high price, buyer A and B at the $300 price, buyer, buyers A, B, and C at the uh, $200 price. And then we have sellers, seller X, Y, and Z, Seller X is just the same person we had on the last slide, the one who would sell the second iPad. Now we're calling it the first, but it's the first one sold. That he's selling it at uh, uh, 200. He preferred to get the 200 to the iPad. And he could outbid uh, seller Y, but if the price were 300, they could both sell or both be willing to sell. And then seller Z will only sell if the price is 400. He prefers that to the iPad. So again, we have more eager and less eager sellers. And when these uh, individuals come together and learn of each other's uh, preferences in the market, uh, they'll trade where the market clears. The reason they trade where the market clears is because that is the price at which all the preferences of all the traders are satisfied. And after all, we engage in action in order to have our preferences satisfied. And so naturally, we don't intentionally uh, you know, act in such a way that our preferences are thwarted. So at the market clearing price, buyer A and buyer B want to buy iPads uh, at the price of 300. Buyer C does not. Seller X and seller Y want to sell. Seller Z does not. So seller X and Y sell to buyers A and B. And uh, buyer C and seller Z stay out of the market because at that price, that's what they wish to do. And so all the preferences of all the traders are satisfied. Notice if we had, uh, to the contrary, if we had a price of $400 in this market, then there would be excess supply, right? All three sellers would want to sell, only one buyer would want to buy. Somebody's preferences will not be satisfied. Some, two of the sellers will not have their preferences satisfied. And so, as uh, uh, Tom uh, Woods was pointing out, uh, since in Austrian economics we treat human beings as real people, we're just talking about real people, just you and I, Real people don't just um, act in such a way that they're, uh, with alternatives available to them, that their preferences are not satisfied. They creatively you know, adjust to their situation. So naturally, uh, buyers, uh, the buyers that are, excuse me, the sellers that are cut out of the market at the high price will not just sit still and say, well, you know, that's too bad. I guess I'll just have to go home and sit on my uh, iPads. No, they lower their price. Right? They preempt, they preempt. Uh, this situation because they have entrepreneurial judgment. They can anticipate this. The sellers can think 
the market would clear at this price. And they can, they can then ask that price. And if it doesn't clear at that price, then they can adapt and adjust. Um, and do, you know, they can market the good. They can adjust their price and so on. And the same with the buyers, right? Uh, so if we had a price below the market clearing, uh, then we would have frustrated uh, buyers. We have, all three would want to buy. Only one of the sellers would want to sell. The buyers just don't sit there and say, well, you know, it's tough luck. I mean, it's just a... You know, it's an inevitable consequence of the technical conditions of the world that I can't buy an iPad. No, they just, they just up the price. They just, they just offer better terms, right? And see if this works. Yeah, so they're willing, remember, they're willing to do this. Uh, buyers A and B are both willing to pay more than 200. And since they're willing to do this, if, they, if they're required to, to buy the good, then that's what they would do. This is what their preferences say, right? This is what we're saying that they're willing to do. So uh, this is why the market clears, why, why we, we can uh, analyze the market by saying the price, uh, you know, this eBay price of $300 is at that price because that's the price at, at that moment two weeks ago. That was the price that cleared the market. Now, maybe today it's different. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this gives us the analysis. Now, now let's uh, deal with this other question that I mentioned about using a used good. What, what, what if we have a newly produced good? What if it's not, uh, you know, just a former consumer of the iPad who bought it and is selling it? What if it's Apple, the producer, and we have new, newly produced iPads? Can't, can't Apple somehow make its supply dependent upon cost of production? And here we want to see the argument as to why this would not be the case. And again, I've just given you the general framework within which we would, we would provide the specific argument about Apple. So the general framework is, again, uh, now, now we have brand new iPads. Right? We have the buyers and the seller. The supplier would be uh, Apple. And uh, the, the, uh, the preferences of the buyers, of course, will always be the value of the good obtained. So we have the, the brand new iPad. And then the value of the money given up, the $500. Now, there are two possible opportunity costs involved in the value of the money given up. In society, there are two possibilities, right? There's the value to the person in personal use of the $500. So if I'm going to buy an iPad, I, that would be one thing that I would consider. I would say, I've got the $500, and, and there's an alternative use for it, and I might value that more than the iPad, then I wouldn't buy. So that would be one thing. I might, I might be saying here is how the value uh, aligns. But the other could be that I could offer the uh, $500 to one seller or another. Right? That could be an opportunity cost foregone as well, right? Because uh, there, there could be multiple sellers in the market uh, that, that would value the $500. And so I can judge the value of that too. So maybe I can get... Maybe from one of the sellers, I could get an iPad plus a new fancy adapter cord, or you know, plus a, uh, a uh, an iTunes card, because they value the money that I'm offering more than another seller. Okay, well then the same thing, the, the same consideration would be true on the supply side. So now we have uh, we have Tim Cook, we have Apple. They're selling, so it's the value of the money they obtain, the $500, and they value that above the value of the iPad they give up when they sell to me or to you. Now, what are the possibilities for the value of the iPad that they give up? Well, they, Tim Cook could use it personally, or some employee of Apple could use it personally. Uh, but of course, uh, the, I think uh, in uh, 2012, there was something like uh, 58 million iPads sold. So again, the marginal utility of personal use would be extremely low for the 58 millionth iPad that's being sold. You know, that has no no personal use value. So, so the other option is to one buyer or another. So if they offer it to me, then you know I would pay the $500. They might find somebody else if they're selling it to me for $500. They might find somebody else who's willing to pay $525. Then what they give up, if they sell it to me, is the 525. Right. So, so, the, so there's com competition between the, the different uh, buyers <clears throat> that represents really the value of the good given up and not the personal use value uh, to, to uh, the suppliers. So 
So in brief, then, uh, it's just exactly the same consideration, right? It's only preferences that determine both sides of this, of this organization, both the supply and the demand side. It's preferences on uh, me and you as buyers of the iPads. It's also just preferences of other consumers on the supply side. Or to put this in a slightly different way as we did at the beginning, once the uh, iPad is produced, then its production costs are foregone. And they cannot be recouped by not incurring those production costs. They've, they've been incurred. And so the opportunity for Apple is to either sell the iPad to me right now or to sell it to some other consumer in the future at what they anticipate might be a better price. And so the supply side is still just preferences. It isn't cost of production. Okay, then the last thing we'll uh, cover is uh, how this, uh, we do have just a moment to, to hint at least at how this uh, process moves of uh, appraisement moves from the consumer goods to the producer goods. So we'll just mention this again and kind of whet your appetite for, for more of this. So I, I looked this up. This was a revenue uh, that uh, Apple got from selling iPads in 2012. They sold 58 million units. Now my price, of course, uh, I'm uh, simplifying here, right? There were different prices depending on the memory and so on. So you'd have to, it's a little bit, the calculation is a little bit more complicated. But that, of course, doesn't deter Apple in making the, the appropriate uh, economizing decision. They just uh, see whether or not consumers are willing to pay 625 or whatever it was to get the 32 gig <sighs> iPad or 500 to get the 16 gig or whatever, how the, however these things were configured, <clears throat> right? So that gives them $29 billion in revenue. And then I looked up the, also, uh, I think it's Wired Magazine or Gizmo or one of these places. They, they buy these, uh, these electronics and then uh, take them apart. And then they see all the components and they find out the prices of the components from the suppliers. And then they add up the prices. So it's a sum of the price of each, of each input times the quantity used, the price of the screen times the quantity, the, you know, one price of the chip times one, so on and so forth, you get $375. If you add up all the component parts of the, of the iPad, it would be their average cost, right? 375. So again, over 58 million units, that gives you 22 billion, so they earn 7 billion on an investment of 22. That, that's a rough calculation, right? The 375 doesn't include all costs. <clears throat> now that, that calculation of what happened in, that, that result of what happened in 2012, gives Apple and Tim Cook the, the ability to make anticipations of what to do in 2013. And in 2013, things are different, right? Because they introduced the Mini. And of the projected 88 million in sales, 50 million are Minis. And only 38 are full-size iPads. So it's, our preferences have changed. They've shifted. And Apple's anticipated this. And by anticipating this, they can bring forth the production of the things, again, that we desire. We're willing, again, $500, but again, it would be different prices, right? The mini is $329, and so the, I'm, uh, I'm just simplifying here. But, uh, uh, and then in comparison with the costs. So this is the way appraisement is undertaken by the entrepreneurs. They look at their past results for uh, a net income, and then they use those results as the basis for making anticipations of what they'll do uh, now with their producer goods. What goods they'll produce, and is it the iWatch or uh, you know, some other uh, consumer good that they hope we will value once it's produced and offered to us. And that's the way our preferences get, get imputed through the pricing system to the factors of production. Uh, I'll end on this note. The, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Apple buys the screens that it uses for the iPad from Samsung. They pay $87 for the screen. Uh, this shows you, by the way, how uh, cooperation is the dominant feature of the market economy. Whereas in politics, these two firms are constantly fighting each other, right? Over IP and so on. Politics is the arena of conflict. The market, the arena of peace and uh, prosperity. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.